Uh, you are at Configuration Management for Humans. Um, there's a reason I didn't call this Configuration 101 or Basics of Configuration, and that is because um, well, it all started with a uh, story of a client of ours uh, very recently. Uh, we inherited a large college project from a major land-grant university. It was the College of Science and Engineering with 28 sub-colleges and departments all running on a Drupal 8 install. And we inherited this project they had been working on internally and quickly realized that uh, they needed more resources, so they brought our team on. And my very first question to them was, how are you using configuration management? And the answer was, ah, uh, we're not. We're doing single file uploads every once in a while, like if I need to add a view. <sighs> so I sort of sighed, but then I thought back, you know, six months before that, our company, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit about uh, in a minute, was also not using configuration management uh, well over a year after Drupal 8 launched. And it dawned on me that there are uh, many uh, people that are not using it, don't understand it, and that it's still this very complex system. And so my hope is that this session will explain it uh, in a very human way uh, that makes sense. Um, where I'm not going to cover a lot of advanced uh, commands or topics. If you want those, I see Mike Potter there. You can time travel back to yesterday and see his uh, advanced configuration management session um, or watch it on video. Um, but he, I believe, covered uh, uh, some of the more advanced commands. This is sort of an overview session that hopefully you will leave here with a fundamental, fundamental understanding of what configuration management is and why you want to use it. So with that said, let's get going. Uh, my name is Tim Broker. Uh, I'm not very active on social media, but you can find me on drupal.org at slash broker. Uh, also, that's my Twitter. I don't tweet very often, but that's me. Um, I have been building websites professionally since 1994, and I, I did a count. I think I've built large-scale systems in over 17 distinct content management systems over those years. Uh, in 2007, when Drupal 5 was released, uh, I switched to Drupal and have been using Drupal uh, pretty much exclusively ever since then. I am currently the co-founder and technical director of a company called Electric Citizen. Uh, we are a full-service Drupal agency in Minneapolis. Um, uh, we have a strong focus on the public sector, so most of our clients are large institutions, colleges, government agencies, cultural institutions, etc. Um, and a uh, quick shout out, we play a big role in organizing the Twin Cities Drupal Camp, which is June 7th through the 10th this year. Uh, it's a great camp with great people, great parties, and great food, so worth the trip if you're in the area. Okay, so with that said, I want to give a quick sort of overview of where this session is going to go. Um, I want to start with some sort of background and context on who I am, or who I was, in 2015, which is when Drupal 8 was released. Um, I want to tell you a little bit more about our journey into configuration management and understanding it. Uh, then a quick Config 101, where I sort of uh, give a quick overview of the basic fundamentals of how this is working. Uh, then we're going to do a demo where we take a site from absolute zero to full configuration which is great, but as we will see, there are uh, a, a handful of problems uh, that come along with that, and we're going to look at some of those and some of the solutions. Then we'll do a uh, sort of a recap of the best practices that we hopefully have learned over the course of this session, and then finally a look into the future and what might be happening uh, as Drupal continues to evolve and grow. Okay, so me, uh, again, I'm a long-term developer, Drupal developer since 2007. This is 2015, the year that Drupal 8 was released. Uh, we have a large client base at this point of Drupal 7 sites, complex sites. Um, we have multiple team members frequently changing and updating those sites. And we are heavily using features to manage all of this. Um, how many people here know and have used features? Just about everybody, okay, great. Um, that was our, as, as with all of you, that was our way of getting things done. Um, in 2015, I know what configuration is, I know it's a difficult problem, and that it's complicated, and I'm a huge believer in Drupal 8. I've been following along um, with the Configuration Management Initiative. I'm very, very excited in 2015 for Drupal 8 to uh, arrive. You, maybe you're like me, you are, uh, maybe you were an experienced Drupal 7 developer, uh, or you could have been more of a casual uh, hobbyist, a WordPress developer. Maybe uh, you are new to CMSs completely in 2015 and you heard about this thing called Drupal 8 and you're, you're there to check it out. Or you're just some random human being who, who wants to use Drupal. 
Drupal itself. Uh, he, we could, we could uh, potentially consider Drupal the antagonist in this story. Um, in 2015, Drupal 7 is uh, king. Um, it's been around for five years, uh, a, a very long time for a system to build up a ecosystem of best practices and ways of doing things. Uh, and then in November of 2015, Drupal 8 is released. And as everyone here probably knows, it's vastly different than any uh, previous version of Drupal that we have seen. And uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but I, could, I would argue that the configuration management system was arguably its most anticipated feature. For me, it was uh, the, the one big thing I was uh, sort of waiting for and hoping for. And that sort of uh, sets the stage for us here. I am going to show you my first experience, just a, 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 a short version of it, of what happened the day I first installed uh, the, the first release of Drupal 8 and encountered configuration management. So configuration, that seems like a good place to start, but uh, right away this looks like old Drupal. I've got configuration, all my stuff here, I don't see anything new yet. Scrolling, scrolling, and finally, configuration synchronization. Not configuration management, but it clearly says import and export. Okay, this must be what I'm looking for. Okay, I click in. There's nothing to import. Okay, that looks good. So let's check out some of these other options. This is literally the first time with me exploring the system. I'm sure some of you have been through this yourself. Okay, sync directory. I, I don't know what this is yet at this point. Configuration archive, a tarball. Now this has me puzzled because we've long since moved past downloading tarballs. So now we're gonna go check it out a little bit more. Single items, pasting a YAML file. And structure, okay, I don't know really what this is. Configuration, there's all these options. Okay, I certainly don't have anything to paste here, so I'm not quite sure what's going on. So let's check out the export option. Okay, export and download a full configuration of this site as a gzipped tar file. Again, this surely can't be what I'm looking for and what I've been waiting for for so long. So let's check out the last option here. Single item export, okay? YAML structure, again, content type. Let's see what this is, okay, we've got an article. And here is my first real exposure to YAML. I have no idea what this is, why it's there, or what's going on at this point. <laughs> Depending on who you are, you're either a little bit uh, overwhelmed right now or underwhelmed. I was a little bit underwhelmed, thinking surely there must be uh, more to this system. So uh, what does an intrepid developer do? But uh, we're going to go read the docs, right? We've uh, explored the UI. We want to uh, check out what the actual official documents tell us. So uh, I first encountered these documents in 2015. You can see here these are our 2018 versions. Um, I went through all the reversions to see how they've changed. They have changed some, but this largely represents the documentation that was there when Drupal 8 launched and that is still there today. And uh, this is going to be a little overwhelming, but I'm going to go through this quickly to show you what I read. And, and uh, if you haven't used configuration uh, before, you're going to be confused by some of the things you see here, but we will work through that. So this is the main page on Drupal.org. The system is designed to make it easy to take live configuration, test changes locally, and export them to files. Perfect, that sounds exactly like what we want. So this is the, uh, the overview. Now, here's my first uh, sign of confusion in this document. Configuration can be exported and imported either in its entirety or a single piece of configuration using Drush and or Drush console config commands or the configuration management. So this is my first sign that uh, this could be a little bit more complex and confusing than I was, than I was hoping for. Scroll down, okay, either a single object can be imported using a copy-paste workflow. Copy-paste, that does not sound right to me. And again, or the full site, and again, this is today, right now on Drupal.org, or the full site can be dumped as YAML files to a tar.gz file. Okay, well, doesn't seem right to me, but we'll keep going and keep reading. It's strongly, re and this is the last page of this, this main document, it's strongly recommended to do a database dump. It could save your life. So now at this point, I know we are in for some, for, for some real trouble. So you know, let's keep going. Workflow using the UI. Again, tar files. Okay, this can't be right. I quickly skim through the rest of this. I see the next one. Workflow using Drush. This page assumes you are familiar with Drush. I am. This sounds like what I'm looking for here. This is surely going to be uh, where the good stuff comes. 
Install Drupal 8, we'll call this site live, perfect. Make a copy, we'll call it development, perfect. Then I read down, and this is still there today on, on this site, uh, a link to the issue queue and something that says, until this issue is fixed, you will need a full copy of the site. Turns out not to be really relevant, but it has me nervous that right in the docs, we have a link to the issue queue. <laughs> okay, so we'll change our site name, that's good, so I'm gonna keep reading down. Okay, da da da. This exports the configuration to your sync directory. I still do not know what this is. No one's told me what my sync directory is. It wasn't in the docs, I didn't see it in the UI. When I do this, it will be deleted. The contents of this folder will be deleted. Ooh, this sounds nervous. I'm back to uh, that database dump to save my life. <laughs> and finally, you may want to change the location of your sync folder. Okay, maybe this is something. So I'm uh, sort of overwhelmed at this point, but I'm gonna go into this next article, changing the location of my sync folder. Okay, by default, Drupal places it in sites default using a hashtag. Thus, sites default files config hash. All right, let's go find this folder. It's not there. So I'm immediately thinking something has gone horribly wrong with my install because I don't have my config sync hash file. Let's keep going. As I read more, I realize that I have to actually create this directory, make, make a change in my settings file, and then that's it. Yes, we're done. And I actually did this, and it was honestly my first taste of victory with configuration management where I felt like I, have, I did something. I have a sync folder. All right, perfect. Now, here's where I get into real trouble. And uh, for people who have been following along with Drupal 7 and 8, uh, the whole idea of configuration management was to store configuration in files and version control so that you can manage them and move them and deploy them. So uh, this is now marked as incomplete. It wasn't when I first came to, to the Drupal.org docs. Um, but I'm thinking at this point, this must be what I want because files, that's what configuration management is all about, getting configuration out of the database and into your files. So I read on. For it to work, I need to modify settings and services YAML files, okay? You should do this before installing Drupal, as it's complex to revert back to database configuration management once you've done this. Uh, okay, I really messed up at this point. I did not do this. Scroll down. Add the following code from this comment, a com comment 104 to, for, so I'm now adding comment, uh, code to my non-existent install from a comment. <laughs> Open the services YAML file. Another comment, add, add this YAML from this comment to your services.yaml file. So I'm in real trouble now. I, uh, I'm really in for it. I don't know what we're gonna do. There's one last article. This was also there on, in 2015, and it's still there today. It's now deprecated, but it was not when I got there. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe this is gonna be the final piece that ties this all together for me. So I have a Drupal 8 site and want to put it on my server. Yes. Up to Drupal 7, this was a rather straightforward process. <laughs> In Drupal 8, CMI gets into the mix and has to be taken care of. Uh, okay. Keep reading, and now here we are talking about tar files again, exporting my database from my local server, importing my database, exporting and importing database, this does not sound right, but voila! We have now <laughs> gone through every single configuration management doc on Drupal.org, and we're done as far as I'm concerned. That's, that's configuration management. <sighs> so at this point, I have no real indication, if, especially if I'm uh, not me, if I'm a new, new to Drupal or new to CMSs, I have no real idea of what configuration even is. I don't know why I'm supposed to use it, how I'm supposed to use it, or management. And uh, you know, I've done all I can. I've gone through the UI, I've read every doc there is, and I've actually uh, done some blog research. Uh, this, so, uh, and I want to preface that I in no way intend to criticize the documentation team and the, the work that's out there and all the bloggers, but the fact is, uh, this is a very difficult topic to talk about and write about because it's using concepts that are new, it's using concepts that are somewhat difficult to understand, and even the words used to describe them. This is the last active comment on a very long thread uh, in the issue queue, arguing over calling it active configuration versus stage configuration active, currently in operation, new, it will, be, it will be imported. People are still arguing about this. And uh, this is a, a quote from a, a still seminal blog post by Matthew Tift, who was uh, very heavily involved in building configuration management. 
When you Google Drupal 8 configuration, this is still, I think, the fifth article that comes up. It was published uh, just in November 2015 when Drupal 8 was released, but yet it still is uh, uh, very high in the Google rankings. And one of his points was, there is no recommended workflow. Some small sites will not ever use it. For the sites that will use it, there is one key question. The truth is there are many, many questions, <laughs> but it's true that today, even today, in uh, 2018, there is still no recommended workflow. Okay, so now we're gonna get into what happened to me and our company, Electric Citizen, at this point. How are we gonna figure this out? So, you know, I wish I could say that I was determined and uh, really ready to charge through this, but the truth is, there was so much new in Drupal 8 that we were, I said, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna worry about this later. Uh, it's optional, clearly I went through the, the config UI, there was nothing wrong, there were no errors, there's no, no messages telling me what to do, so let's learn some uh, other things. You know, we have to learn Composer and Symphony and object-oriented programming. And we have features that work. And as uh, Mike Potter, who's sitting right there again, a maintainer of the features module, uh, uh, was actively, not just Mike, everyone was actively pushing features and making sure that features were gonna work with Drupal 8 and in conjunction with configuration management and everyone else was doing the same thing, including most of the early uh, and I think current Drupal 8 distros, for example, Lightning, I believe, still comes packaged with a bunch of features and a lot of people were still using features because that simply is what we knew. Uh, so we charged forward and uh, rebuilt our first Drupal 8 site with features the same way we did in Drupal 7 and uh, quickly ran into no small amount of problems. Especially when we uh, got further along and tried to combine our features with configuration, um, suddenly we had this real mess on our hands and, and we sort of stopped even thinking about trying to use configuration and we literally sort of carried on this way for over a year until one particular day, July 26th, 2017, I'm uh, browsing Drupal Planet and I see this headline, stop using features. Hmm, so that caught my eye. And if you look down at the bottom there, by Mike Potter, software architect. Mike has devoted a large portion of his career over the past X number of years, promoting and working on and developing features, including in Drupal 8. When I saw that name and that headline, uh, I, 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 my heart started racing a little bit. It was like, what, what do you mean, stop using features? So I continued reading. Drupal 8 sites still using features for configuration deployment need to switch to the simpler core workflow. Uh, okay, so I'm feeling we're probably doing something wrong here. Let's keep reading. Point seven, where he says the list goes on. Points one through six were detailed explanations of every single problem we had been fighting for months and months and months with features and configuration, the list goes on, and it did go on. So why, why were we using it, and why is it still being used? Uh, as I uh, referenced before, up until a few months before this, it was the default workflow. Acquia BLT was using features. And then here was the one that really resonated with me. My old D7 workflow using features still seems to mostly work. I'm used to it and just deal with the new problems and I don't have the resources to update my build tools and processes. That was us, that was our company on this day. So, on that day, it was a Wednesday, I, I looked this up. I went home, this was a late in the afternoon when I found this article, and I stayed up that entire night uh, devoted to learning what configuration was all about and, and trying to find a way to solve our, our pain and the problems we had been dealing with. And by the following Monday, uh, when I came into the office, I had my first site uh, using complete configuration management. I ripped out all of our features and uh, very quickly I brought that to our developers and uh, that has been our life ever since. I have not touched a feature since that day. Uh, we've, uh, uh, confession, our, our corporate website, electriccitizen.com, still is running features because of the Cobbler's Children uh, situation and that was the first Drupal 8 site we did. But other than that, uh, we are now fully devoted to using configuration management. So, we are now going to, uh, and so this, some of this might be uh, basic for some of you, but uh, I've, uh, in preparation for this and through, uh, you know, just over the past few years, I've seen so many sessions and posts that start off with this uh, premise that you already know what configuration is and, and 
you know, immediately they say, okay, just export and import, and you don't really know. So I'm going to just uh, give a very basic overview of what even is it. Uh, the very first thing you do when you install Drupal or, or WordPress or Joomla or any other CMS typically is you configure it. Uh, in Drupal's case, you're choosing your language, you're setting up your database, you're configuring your site name. It's, the first thing you do is configure it. And then in the Drupal world, you configure things like your content types and your related fields. You configure your block layouts, your menus. You configure if you want a, a main menu and maybe a, a secondary and a tertiary menu. Your taxonomies, all of this, configuration, your views, how they all work, configuration. Uh, some people don't realize this one, but uh, when you are enabling a module, you are configuring Drupal to say this module is enabled. And then basically everything you see on this uh, page, which looks again a lot like Drupal 7 did, is your configuration. If you install a module, it might say, you know, configure stage file proxy. That's all configuration. Uh, it's distinct from your content. I think most people get this, but a lot don't. Um, and I say usually because there are some gray areas like web forms, but configuration is not your blog posts. It's not your menu items. It's your menu structure. It's not your taxonomy terms. It's your vocabulary where those terms are stored. It's distinct from your theme, kind of, or usually. Um, it has nothing to do with your CSS files or your JavaScript. Uh, there are a few uh, places in Drupal in the appearance where you do configure some things, and I'll show a quick example of that later. And it's stored in your database, historically. Um, just about every CMS in the world, you s install a database, you configure it, and that's where it lives. OK, so now we have a, a real brief overview of what configuration is. Why, why do we want to manage it? So, this is actually sort of an ancient problem in the software world that uh, has been around for a long time outside of the CMS world. Um, and the idea is how do we come up with repeatable, dependable processes for making frequent and complex changes to an existing system? Um, so why do we want to manage it? So technically, because of that, you don't. Most websites today, I would, I would venture to say, 90% run pretty close to this model. You have a developer making changes, maybe not right live, and I'll show you a little bit more on that later, but generally the idea is you change something on your live site, your users are seeing that one-to-one -one relationship. That's how most CMSs work uh, without things like features, etc. cetera. Um, but the truth is that the real world is quite a bit more complicated that, than that. Um, you have a team, typically, Maybe not, but often you do, um, especially as websites get more complex. You have a client. That could be your boss. It could be someone that's paying you to build your website. You have, uh, the client typically has content editors, people who are actively also doing things on that site, and your users, of course. And so with those added complexities, um, over time, uh, the expectations around a website start to grow. Your team wants to be able to make changes easily. The client wants to approve changes and see them somewhere else before they affect their live site. They don't want things to break. Uh, they don't want downtime. They don't uh, want to have a content freeze or a code freeze. And then over time, the expectations start to grow as things get more complex. And with that, typically comes more complications. Um, you start adding more modules, more uh, 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 more complex theming, um, you're adding things, changing things, uh, new features, fixes, and uh, that also tends to grow over time, and this problem of how are we going to manage it becomes uh, harder to answer. So how do we do it? Uh, historically, this is the model with, that most people start with. You know, the idea is, okay, we're not going to do stuff right on our live server. Let's set up a, a local development environment, a dev server, and a test server, the client up there on the right interacts with that test server. When they approve it, it goes to live. That's great. That's sort of uh, the de facto standard these days with Acquia, Pantheon, Platform.sh. The idea is you can set up these servers where you can do different things, but it does not solve our problem. How do we deploy? How do we get our code from our local site to the dev server, to the test server, and back to live without uh, breaking anything? So this, this you know, Tiered architecture doesn't really solve the issue. It sort of is the first step that helps us get there, though. So, you know, historically, the typical approaches have been content freezes. You tell your client, you know what? We have this complex thing to, to do, so your team needs to stop working on the website for one week. 
Our team is going to work on it, and then we're going to re-upload your database, and then everything will be great. Back to my earlier slide, that expectation these days uh, does not usually go over so well. Code freezes, same thing, or features, which is what a lot of you probably did and what we did. Uh, and a lot of people in the Drupal 7 world would write, uh, you know, using C tools exports or custom modules, would find a way around this, you know, on a, a, a much more a high le a higher level of uh, technology and, and strategies than than something like a content freeze. So that worked, but in fact, it was, you know, still quite painful. Uh, features, as you probably know, could be very difficult to work with. Sometimes um, they were error prone to create because you had to go through a checkbox of about. 400 individual items to, to get there. Uh, not everything could be featureized. There was a module called Strongarm, et cetera. Uh, so, and, and literally, it felt like half our team's life sometimes was, was devoted to working with features and figuring out why they were overridden and figuring out how to get them reverted. It was uh, very painful. So how do we fix it? So I don't know how many people were in DrupalCon uh, Chicago in 2011, but uh, Dries gave his state of Drupal address. Uh, Drupal 7 was still quite new and everyone was excited about it, but almost his entire state of Drupal address was about how painful certain aspects of Drupal still were, despite how great uh, Drupal 7 was. And the number one point that he brought up was this idea of configuration and features and how difficult that is. And uh, right at that conference and shortly after, he uh, declared the configuration management initiative as the first sort of step forward with Drupal 8, and I, he uh, appointed Greg Dunlap, otherwise known as Hayrocker, as the lead of that initiative. And one year later at DrupalCon Denver, I think 2012, uh, the first iteration of this had been committed to core, and we were on our way. So today, so Drupal 8, 2.5 years old. Uh, as everyone who's worked with Drupal 8 knows, it's still sort of evolving in front of our eyes. Every six months, there's big changes. Uh, people are still confused. I'll go back to my earlier story about our client who was not using configuration management despite this very complex system, and they just didn't know how or why to use it. They were new to Drupal, and, and they were afraid of it. So let's figure out how it works. Now, I've seen uh, several charts and, and, and documents trying to explain the basics. This is my attempt. I apologize if it doesn't work, but we're going to quickly run through this. So we're back to our first model where we have a website in Drupal. When you configure it, that is called your active configuration. It lives in your database. Everything that your users see is coming right from that active configuration in your database. That's how most things work before configuration. On day zero, you're not using configuration management until you take this step. You export your active configuration to code. You are now technically using configuration management. It's your first step. You have a one-to-one -one state between what's in your active config and what you've exported. They match perfectly. Now, typically the next step is your team, or you, takes that exported code and imports it to a local server or a local development environment, and now your entire team is in a one-to-one -one state with your active configuration. Then this is what we're all here for. You actually get to go do your work. You build content types. You add fields and views, or maybe it's a small bug fix or a change. That's, that's sort of the key point of all of this is why, why we're here is trying to get work done, right? So your, your team does your work. They then take that code and export it again. It now does not match your active configuration on your live site. It matches the work that your team has done. Now you then import it again to uh, typically a, a staging server or a dev server where your client can then review your new work. No one has touched your active config yet. Your users are still seeing exactly what is in your database. Your client is looking at this and getting ready to approve it. And finally, you, you know, it's okay, this looks great. You then import it into your production database. Those changes that were made over in the work stage have now been imported and they are now your active config. Your users are seeing those changes. It's in the database. It's your active configuration. This cycle then repeats over and over and over again throughout the life cycle of a project where, OK, now it's tomorrow and someone else wants to make a change. All right, let's export the active config, import it, make our changes, export it, import it for review, and then finally import it back. That's the basics. So. <laughs> I get that that could be uh, confusing for some, and it's, it is. It's a hard concept to talk about sometimes, but let's sort of walk through a, 
a demo now of how it actually works in Drupal 8. Uh, zero to full configuration. Uh, so for the purposes of this, I'm starting with a, a fresh Drupal install uh, out of the box. In theory, you could have an active Drupal 8 website that has been being worked on for the past year, but no one was using configuration management. The same principles I'm about to show uh, apply to both. But for the purposes of the demo, we'll start with a, a basic site. So step one, install Drupal. Uh, I, don't, I won't talk much about this, but typically you'll want to use Composer, Git for version control, and Drush. I consider those sort of the cost of entry these days for, for working with a Drupal 8 site. Uh, then your next step is to install a local copy, a cloud copy, and I say cloud, I don't mean necessarily cloud, it could be any hosting infrastructure, or you could do this in reverse, that's those two arrows, it doesn't matter which one starts first. The idea though is you get two sites in a one-to-one -one state that are identical. So here I have my local site running Lando, which is a great uh, local development environment if you haven't used it. And then on Pantheon I have an exact clone of this site. They're identical. Perfect. Next step, define your config folder. So this was that document that I referenced earlier where I felt my first uh, taste of victory. Uh, still the very first thing you should do. Um, it is optional, but uh, highly recommended not to use, in my opinion, the, the default hashtag version. I like to have more control over that, and in particular, I like to keep it out of my project route. Um, you know, technically it doesn't matter, but the idea is you want control over where your configuration is going to live. So in your settings file, you'll actually have an entry like this. Uh, this is in that document on Drupal.org if you're ready to take this step, where you're defining, okay, where is my configuration going to live? Then we're going to export it, okay? That was uh, step one in our, in our earlier chart. So until you export, you can set up your config folder, you can have your two sites, you are still not using configuration management. If you go into your configuration synchronization, synchronization screen, it will tell you there's nothing to do. So this is really when it comes into effect, so we're gonna do this. So I'm gonna do two examples here. The first is a, a tarball, which uh, I'm not gonna follow through on because I think this is the wrong way, but you can do it this way. The idea is you export your configuration, save it to a tarball, download that file, and unzip it into that folder that we just defined. But I think there's a better way, and that is with Drush. So Drush CEX is a shortcut for Drush Config Export. Uh, it takes a little bit of, it's a little bit of an intensive process here because it's comparing um, our active config, well actually right now it's just exporting it. So okay, success. We've exported to our config sync folder that we defined, so let's look at that. And now, uh, I think by default there's somewhere over 725 YAML files that have been created and dumped into this config directory. Um, so you know, I'm scrolling through them. And oh, my screen's cut off there, but what I'm doing right now is uh, uh, opening up one of these files to see it, because I have never seen one before. And there it is. There, uh, oh, we have some, uh, this is gonna potentially cause a few issues moving forward, but uh, up above there is my name, configuration management for, for humans. This is my YAML file, great. Okay, so we've configured our, 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 exported our configuration, it's all there. Now we're at that work step where, okay, let's get to, uh, whoop, I guess I have a slide here. Oh, I wanted, I forgot about this, uh, this uh, slide, but in your database is an exact, uh, it's called the config table. There's a one-to-one -one correlation between every entry in this table and those 725 files. It's stored as a blob file, so I'm gonna download it just to see what this one looks like. Sorry, <laughs> I'm editing it, but there is the version in the database, and there's my title, Configuration Management for Humans, which matches, again, exactly in a one-to-one -one state with the configuration that I have exported. So now we get to the work part, the site building part. Um, this is again where the fun stuff happens. So I'm gonna uh, actually just quickly make a few changes. I'm on my local site here, configuration. Say my client has said, okay, this isn't actually for humans, let's make this configuration management for robots. We have a new uh, target demographic. We're gonna automate everything. This is no longer for humans. Okay, we're gonna save, our, save this, uh, this piece of configuration, in this case our site name and our slogan. Okay, success, great. Uh, and while we're doing that, let's uh, really spice up this site a little bit and uh, 
change our theme. They think it's boring. We're going to go to a, a hot firehouse red here. How many people have ever actually used the color module? Really? OK, great. Talk to me later about how and why. <laughs> OK, success. Let's go check it out. Perfect. We've now got this great fire, firehouse red. We're all about robots. Perfect. So we now have those changes, and we need to export them again. Uh, normally in Drupal 7, this is where we'd start creating features. But no, we're going to export. Um, Okay. Now again, I could use the UI and download a tarball, but in this case, uh, that you, uh, you can't see it, but I'm typing Drush CEX right now, and shortly it's going to tell us uh, success. I hope. This is the uh, sort of intensive process where it's comparing what's in the database and what's in your file system. Uh, so there they are. Okay, there's our new uh, bar tick settings, system site. Okay, yes. Success. Okay, we have exported our configuration into that cold code folder that we looked at earlier. Our next job is to deploy it. Uh, how do we get it from here to there? Okay, uh, again, I apologize, you can't see my commands, but I, I ran a uh, git status here. I can see that I've got some changed files. Got some new files. And so what I'm going to do now is do a git add to make sure that I pick up any new files that were created. So that will happen anytime you are uh, making a new field or a new view. You're going to have a new, and you export, you're going to have a new file that somehow needs to get into your uh, repository. So I'm now, I added it. I'm now doing a commit message, making some sweet configuration changes. And once that's done, I'm going to do a git push. Uh, and again, this could be tarballs. You could be uh, unzipping them and then manually uploading them to a server. Uh, in this case, though, uh, we're doing a, a, a git push. Deploying these back to Pantheon. Perfect. They are now there. Export. Deploy. So let's go check our changes. They've been pushed to Pantheon. OK, that's my local site. Just to review, robots, red. Let's go to our Pantheon site. Hmm, they're not there yet. Let's refresh. Still not there. Okay, let's see here. Let's go check out the uh, config UI and see what's going on. Clear cache. Maybe this will help. Still not there. We forgot something. Import our changes. We can't just deploy them. You now have to do the next step, which which is to actually go into your system and import. Uh, so we're going to go do that. In this case, I am going to use the UI. This could also be done using the drush config import command, but for visuals, I think it's nice to see this. So in our config UI, we can look at the differences between what we have here. Now here's where things get confusing. Active, OK, that's humans. Robots, that's staged, a very confusing term. Let's go back to our configuration page. Let's import all. Synchronizing, okay, it imported successfully. Now, back to our site. Perfect, we've just pushed changes from our local, deployed them to Pantheon, imported them, and we are good to go. So at, at its most basic level, this is just absolute magic for anyone that's worked with features or, or, or tried to do this using other methods. My example was very simple, but that same uh, principle could be used for adding you know, countless views, fields, content types, all the configuration we talked about anymore. You don't have to think about it. You export it, you import it. Uh, you're not working with feature madness and reverts. Uh, in my description of this session, I said 30% time savings. Uh, I think it could be even more in some regards. Uh, 